If it's round, rubber, and rolls, we've got it at Clarksville Tire Center. We're the tire and service specialists because we concentrate on it. New tires for cars and trucks for everybody in Clarksville. Tires, tires, and more tires. New tires from Clarksville Tire Center. Plus retread, shocks, tune-ups, and a whole lot more. So roll on in to Clarksville Tire Center. If it's round, rubber, and rolls, we've got it. If it's round, rubber, and rolls, we've got it. If you need some new tires, you'll be a happy buyer. If you need tires, we've got them. Tires, lots of tires in service. We're located at 129 Terminal Road in Clarksville. Clarksville Tire Center. If you want to know what's going on in Clarksville, listen to WJZM Radio and worldwide at WJZM.com. WJZM is Clarksville's most dependable radio station for local news and current events. Since 1941, serving the public interest. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh. I got a charge again. I'm calling Fletcher Long. They searched the car again. They couldn't find nothing wrong. I got a charge again. I'm calling Fletcher Long. They searched the car again. They couldn't find nothing wrong. All right, this is Clarksville.com Realties, the long version. You can tweet us at Long Version Show. You can Facebook us at uh, The Long Version. And you can call us at 931-645-6414. We have a very special treat uh, for you this a.m. Her name is Kathy Russin, and she is the founder of CourtChatter.com, a legal site which allows uh, viewers on a national scale to view high-profile cases and chat live as they watch the trial streams. She's a native of Utah and spends her time researching and reporting on high-profile criminal cases with help from a large network of industry contacts, one of which would be I, I would, I would presume. Kathy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am doing very well, better than probably uh, I, I deserve. You are down in Athens, Clark County, is uh, in Georgia, correct? Uh, no, I'm actually in physically in Utah right now, oh, and wow. I'm covering the trial via the live stream. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you're you're covering an interesting one. Now, I I you you're familiar with me cuz you do research and you know that I handled a lot of high profile uh criminal defense cases. Absolutely. From, from March to the Wooded Rapist to Holly Bobo to uh uh, uh the Vanderbilt uh, uh rape defense. Uh and so, you know, our paths have crossed before. I believe you have probably seen some footage of me. Absolutely, we watched you every. <laughs> our our, uh, our site showed um, the entire Vanderbilt case, so uh, our viewers and chatters on Court Chatter are very familiar with you. And then the appearances you had with Jason Autry in the Holly Bobo case. So, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on my little radio show. I'm, uh, you might be the most significant and famous person that I've ever had on, and I, I actually, <laughs> I actually have had some famous people on, and. I I'm trying to get John. I'm I'm going to try to get John J. Hooker on uh, for this Friday. But anyway, I'm I'm excited uh, that that you are on. Take us through the Jamie Hood trial that you're covering. What is interesting about this? This was a guy that is accused of of killing uh, a police officer. I think he might have shot multiple police officers, and he is defending himself pro se in what amounts to a capital punishment case. Yes, absolutely. Oh, the, the circus that is the Jamie Hood trial. So, Jamie Hood did shoot two police officers, one um, fatally, uh, and one survived. And he's also on trial for a murder four months prior to that of an associate of his, um, a civilian. And they've merged, they've merged the two murders and the attempted murder, and so he's on trial for all three of those, and then multiple kidnapping charges related to hostage situations. Um, he's got 70 count indictment. And what is interesting about this to me, Kathy, is that he has decided, perhaps narcissistically, to undertake a pro se defense. 
and <laughs> you you have been very, I want to I want to I want to compliment you. You have been you have fairly in, and impartially tweeted out the uh, proceedings as they have uh, been ongoing. But this uh, what what it, what you have and as I read through your site, I. I this has to be one of the most unwise defense strategies maybe ever unfurled in a courtroom. Is, is, well, is, is that what you're witnessing? The saying that the one, the one who represents himself has a fool for a client was made for Jamie Hood. How did, did he... Any idea, Kathy, why he would undertake this? I mean, he doesn't have any legal training of which I'm aware other than he's probably been in court quite a bit. Well, he, a uh, complete and total narcissist, absolutely 100%, but I think most killers are. But he, um, he really believes that everyone in law enforcement is out to get him or has something against him, and that ex extends on to attorneys. So he's, he's gone through, he fired two sets of, um, his, uh, two, two teams of attorneys. You know, this, these killings happened at the end of the at the end of 2010 and the beginning of 2011. So this case has been going on for years. Right. And so he has gone through sets of attorneys. He believes everyone's out to get him. He thinks the first set of attorneys were in cahoots with the prosecutor. Um, he accuses everybody of everything. He has a brother that was shot and killed by police in Athens about 10 years prior to this incident, which plays into his defense, by the way, of he, this. He has given and that as so, the reason for his state of mind that he believed these officers yes. posed him an immediate, an immediate threat of harm. Is right. that right? He, he calls it a justification defense. Not right. only self-defense, but justification defense. So, he, so that's why. In the end, he wants to represent himself because he doesn't believe that the the um, his defenders that that public defenders um, will do what he, they he, he, every time he went for a pretrial hearing, he would just tell the judge that um, they won't they're not listening to me. They won't listen to me. They won't listen to me. You know, nobody knows what Jamie Hood wants except Jamie Hood. And so he thinks he can do a better job than anyone else. And that's why finally, after many years, uh, they had, you know, they had to have mental competency hearings. They went through a lot. And finally, the judge is allowing him in a capital case. He's up for the death penalty to represent himself. And, and let me say this, too. He has raised questions about the judge's ability to be impartial. Apparently, the yeah. judge... Um, had a a relative uh that was shot uh and that he believes that that would cloud his ability to be fair and impartial uh is is is, is that the gist the judge's own father was killed and and so Jamie brings up in a pretrial hearing, um, was your father, right to the judge, was your father killed by a black man? Okay, so Jamie Hood is black, the judge right. is white. Uh, Jamie Hood, uh, the officer, buddy Christian, that, um, that Jamie killed, and he admits he killed him, so we don't have to say allegedly that he killed, buddy Christian was white. So he asked the judge, was your father killed by a black man? And the judge says yes, and so then Jamie says, you know, are you, I don't, I don't know if you're able to be, impartial in this case and then the judge was like well i'm here to do a job so he did bring that up um you know that this, this judge was never recused from this case so that was brought up a couple years back i'm gonna say too and and uh, i've followed the coverage on your website which is courtchatter.com uh, if anybody uh, any of the listeners want to want to tune in to that you should it's it's very well done you the articles in here written by some of your associates and some by you are, are quite well done and appear to accurately depict what's being unfurled in in front of them via the live stream so i commend you on that but uh, there is a uh, the, i have kind of followed this and it seems to me that the judge has has provided him enormous latitude to engage in what a whatever type of cross examination he he deems would be acceptable, and ha, and has given him probably more latitude than he would have given a licensed attorney. Would you not agree? Oh, absolutely. Now you you, will, you would know this better than I would, but I have consulted with um, actually at Court Chatter. We have a um, legal analyst on that, our team. Is that Joe Jeff Johnson? Gold, which is. That's not uh, Joe sorry, Johnson. Is, uh, that's not Joe Johnson, or, or who? Who is your legal no. analyst? 
No, 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 no. Joe's a reporter. Okay. No, we have an attorney. We have a, an attorney, Jeff Gold, who's a he's a he was former prosecutor and he's a criminal defense attorney and he's a TV legal analyst and he is court chatter's legal analyst and I've consulted with him and um, and you I'm sure you know this as well but the jo- the judge isn't just you know letting him do this or whatever the judge is required on a pro se defendant to give him wide latitude uh-huh. and that's what's and that's what's happening you know he's required to help him he doesn't have to you know you know say you need to ask this and this but he he's required to help Jamie Hood through this process of representing himself he's also given him standby counsel so at any time Jamie t- turns back turns around and he consults with the people he fired right <laughs> that are sitting behind him we used to, um, we, with the second we, set of people he fired <laughs> we, we used to call that babysitting you know in a capital exactly. murder case where someone insisted on a pro se defense the judge would sometimes appoint the lawyer whom he had uh, relieved as a a consultant, if you will. But we used to call it babysitting. You know, you now got to babysit right. this guy, and of course he's not. Well, he, he he never listened to you when you were his defense. So I don't know why he'd listen to you now. But I, I do want to remark that it has been my observation that um, the judge has granted him a, a great deal of latitude. Uh, that's interesting because I did want to get your opinion on that because we haven't seen maybe maybe one other you know I've been for years I've been covering cases and just watching and for years prior to that just as a person who wanted to enjoyed watching trials you know when it was court TV and I just I've never maybe once I've seen a person represent themselves like this yeah. um, and so I didn't everyone on my site all the chatters on my site are going crazy thinking the judge is giving him way way too much latitude and I keep kind of reining them in saying look it's a death penalty case you know the guy's fighting for his life and he's representing himself so the judge kind of needs to give him a wide latitude while at the same time you know it's a fine line the judge is walking on you know for the appeal process on how far to let him go and um so I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how far. I, I was going to ask you that. You know, I, I is he going be, too far? And it, I'm sure it's a. I would be happy. Tight rope act. I, I would be happy to weigh in on that, and I would also be happy to consult with y'all on any matters in which you want in the future to consult. But in, in my estimation, I think it's a wise strategy of the judge to allow him a great deal of latitude, uh, because yeah. uh, in a, if, if the death penalty is imposed, and it's likely in in this type of a case. Uh, there is going to be uh, an exhaustive appellate process, and if you allow him every nod, ev- evidentially speaking, if you let him put anything and everything in that he wants, the likelihood of reversal on appeal diminishes greatly. Right. You see, because the one thing the Court of Criminal Appeals or, or the Supreme Court, and, and this is in Georgia, correct? Yes. All right. The one thing they're they're probably not going to reverse on. Uh, appellately is uh, factual questions resolved in favor of one side or the other. They're going to defer to the court's finding as far as the resolution of factual disputes. So if you want to, li- if you can leave it a factual dispute and not an evidentiary matter of law that they can review de novo, you're better off on an appellate uh, uh, aspect. So that's probably why he's doing what he's doing. But I can tell you this as a pretty seasoned uh, former trial practitioner. Uh, the uh, evidence that he was allowed to get in about uh, his brother being shot many, many years prior, and to the extent that it formed in him a, a, a state of mind that he was in immediate danger, if he has professional trial counsel, that's probably too remote to be admitted. Well, that, that hasn't come. That hasn't come in as evidence yet. Oh, okay. It's just it, so it was written about. He, it's it, it was his intent, I guess. Today, that's what he, that's exactly it. He's been arguing outside the presence of the jury, presence of the jury to the judge that he wants to, that that shows his um, intent and his state of mind. And he wants to be able to show um, that. Today, by the way, begins his defense case. So the, the prosecution rested on Saturday. That's another interesting thing about this case. The jury was brought in from another county, and so they are sequestered. So the judge holds long days, and they even go to court on Saturdays. Right. Um, the pros- yeah, the prosecution rested on Saturday. So Jamie Hood began his own case this morning. So we're going to see what the judge is going to allow him to do and not do this week. He also informed the judge on Saturday that he will be taking the stand. 
um, and he's prepared to be cross-examined. Now, that is something nobody wants to miss. It's Jamie Hood on the stand. Nobody loves to hear Jamie Hood talk more than Jamie Hood. He also can't control himself. The you know, during pretrial the, hearings over the over the years, yeah. he's been removed from the courtroom multiple times. You know, the narcissism just it, it it's just an affliction that, that he cannot overcome. Yeah. Now, now, Kathy, if you don't mind, uh, and I hope you don't mind me calling you Kathy, I feel like I know Absolutely you. Absolutely not. <laughs> after after covering me as many times as you did, I feel like I know you. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, I read all the stuff you wrote about. Anyway, uh, Kathy, <laughs> uh, uh, he. Um, I've got listeners that, that ask questions, and they generally ask via the Internet. If you don't mind, I, uh, I've got one. Uh, sure. one. One guy wants to know, uh, he says, I if Jamie Hood decides to take the stand, does he get to question himself? So this is really a technical aspect question, uh, and I'd like to take a stab at it because in Tennessee, uh, he would get to testify in the narrative on his direct examination. He would get to just tell the story. He would not have to ask himself questions, but now he would be subjected to question and answer cross-examination. What, what is your but, take in Georgia? Yeah, so I have found, I had, I had to research this, um, and they have, there has been a, um, a little write-up done because the reporters in Georgia also researched this, and then I also asked our legal analyst about this. Um, and there was a case that went up and was a, appealed, and a federal court ruled on a case in Georgia about this. So I've done a lot of research on this, and the bottom line, when it came down from the appellate court on another case, in the very end, it, it really does say that it's going to be Judge Haggard's call on this. So okay. That really is the bottom line. But what it looks like is Jamie Hood um, will... <laughs> He will have a choice, and his standby counsel, he can choose to have them come up and ask him the questions. My guess is he's not going to want to do that. But he very likely, the judge is not going to let him go off on narrative, and, and most people agree on this in the community in Georgia, um, that one, that the judges do not like that, but two, Jamie Hood can't control himself or his mouth. So there has the cases in Georgia, especially the one that was appealed, and then the federal court came down, that, that judge would not allow a narrative, and the defendant himself had to ask himself a question and then answer that question. And that is the forum. That is the forum that took place in that trial, and the higher court upheld that. So wow. that could happen. Jamie Hood could ask himself a question and then answer the question, and that is that's how that could go. Well, that we could, don't know. It's going to be up to the judge. That could mess up his mojo. Another question is somebody asked after he questions himself if that is what happens. Can he take the fifth on cross? And I'm going to answer that you can give an allocuted statement in some instances that does not subject you to cross-examination in Tennessee by statute, which is this case is not in Tennessee. However, once he takes the stand in the, in the guilt phase of this trial, I, I think that he has waived his Fifth Amendment privilege. So I believe, that, I believe that he would have to answer the questions. That's our first break. We'll be back with more. Kathy Russin here on The Long Version, brought to you by Clarksville.com Realty. As the name Clarksville.com Realty implies, we know Clarksville, and moreover, we are passionate experts in the Clarksville, Tennessee real estate market. Whether you are planning to buy a new home in Sango or sell one in the fields of North Mead, your experience should be a positive one. Our philosophy is simple. Listen first, offer guidance and suggestions, then act with confidence. Expect the following. Expert analysis of your wants and needs. Again, we must listen to you. Superior knowledge of the inventory of homes for sale in Clarksville. Masterful systems and methods that have proven themselves throughout our years of experience. A closing table full of smiles. Get started today by visiting Clarksville.com. Just one word, Clarksville.com. We know Clarksville so well, we bought it. Clarksville.com. A lot of real estate is bought and sold in Clarksville, and all of it has to be inspected, and it has to be done right. It's your largest investment of your life. Do you want to leave its inspection to someone who isn't the best? Of course not. 931-980-5759 gets you the best inspection services. Call Bud Wink at 931-980-5759 to get the home you are buying or selling inspected by the best inspection services. 
That's 931-980-5759. Z-Best Inspection Services, changing the quality of home inspections one house at a time. Everybody is driving to Stuart Williams Furniture Company, located on 801 Memorial Boulevard in Springfield, Tennessee. They are open Monday to Saturday, 8 to 5, and boast a superlative selection in all the popular name brands at modest prices, which defy belief. Browse the selection at StuartWilliamsFurniture.net. That's S-T-E-W-A-R-T, no space, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, F-U-R-N-I-T-U-R-E, dot net. Call 615-384-7584. Stuart Williams Furniture Company in Springfield, Tennessee, where they either have or can get you everything to make your house a home. A lot of real estate is bought and sold in Clarksville, and all of it has to be inspected and it has to be done right. It's your largest investment of your life. Do you want to leave its inspection to someone who isn't the best? Of course not. 931-980-5759 gets you the best inspection services. Call Bud Wink at 931-980-5759 to get the home you are buying or selling inspected by the best inspection services. That's 931-980-5759. The best inspection services. Services, changing the quality of home inspections one house at a time. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. This is Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version. Today we're getting the long version of national uh, media consultant reporter, someone who uh, covers high-profile uh, trials, uh, Kathy Russin, and you can, and that's Kathy with a C, and you can get her at courtchatter.com. She also tweets Kathy at Court Chatter, I believe. Is that right, Kathy? Yep, that's right. And uh, you can also ask her a question by you can uh, you can really tweet it directly to her if you should choose, and she'll just have to tell me she got it. Uh, but uh, you can send it to at uh, uh, Long Version Show or Facebook us at the Long Version. Uh, and we were talking about the the Jamie Hood case, but you're you're covering much more than the Jamie Hood case. I mean, you you've got a true national. Uh, uh, spread here you you've got the 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 theater uh shooting in in Colorado uh where the defense uh um is i believe uh, have has rested their case and the closing arguments are this week and uh you've got yes you're also covering Dylan Roof uh in uh Charleston South Carolina yes and, and so you you've, if, you've really if it's you're, making the news or if uh they're live streaming the trial that you know, we're we're on top of it. You know, that's here's here's what how court chatter was born was really when um court T V went away on on there are people that are fascinated with the legal process and they're everyday people that wanna see what's happening in our courtrooms and uh they, they so when court T V went away there's, they live stream them on the internet, and they want to know, and they want to talk about it, and that's how Court Chatter was, was born. So we have a live chat room, and they we stream the trial on the, the screen there with the chat box down the side, and people can just sit there and in real time talk about the case they're they're seeing on the screen. We, you know, we watched you in the Vanderbilt case, and they can sit there and yell at you. <laughs> And, and while did, they're and while they're did. watching the case, and, so, and some did. So, what do you, <laughs> what do you think, Kathy? Do you, you, you think this is the ultimate in in drama in today's society? I mean, there's so much interest in this. It's the um, it's it's been called sometimes, you know, the alternative to the soap operas or or whatever. It's the real life. It's the real life drama playing out on the screen and people get and people get very um sometimes sometimes they get emotionally involved or they get they get attached to victims family members if they if the camera can pan to them in the gallery long enough or they really get involved in the backstory of what's happened or um you know i would say i would say the, a majority is probably prosecution minded um 
But I've got some really, really, really smart people because they've been trial watching for a long time, and um, you know they want the prosecution to prove their case to them. So I went. So you know I've got some real defense-minded people on there, and they do a lot of research. And um, but it's just, it's a fascinating. It's a fascinating thing that's out there, this, this trial watching. Um, they let the criminal, whole criminal justice process. It isn't just for the legal field anymore. It isn't just for attorneys. Every average, everyday people, retired people, disabled people, stay-at-home moms, this is what they enjoy. They want to see our criminal justice system at work. I mean, you have quite a following, too. Uh, l- let me ask you this question. Was there, and I'll, I'll give you this opportunity to ask me a question. Was there anything about the defense that I undertook in the first trial that you had any question about? That case, and now, it's going to happen all over again. What did you think very, about that decision? I want to get your impression of that decision. That Monty uh, well, I, 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 well, look, I called it. I called it as soon as it came out. Yeah. As soon as, as soon as Todd Easter went on the media, as soon as his uh, rapist, really, the statutory rape, but as soon as he came out and said, this is what happened, I called it immediately. You know, I've been doing this long enough to know how this goes during jury selection. Right. If you, you don't disclose, so regardless of how I feel about the defendants in that case, um, I knew, I knew what the right thing to do was. I knew the right thing to do was it, to preserve our jury system in this country and to preserve what how our jury system needs to be, that needed to be a mistrial, and those two need to go on trial again. And that is not what the majority of the of the public, and especially my chatters, want to hear. They really think those two are guilty, and they don't want to see that happen. Um, but to preserve our jury system, that that the judge did the right thing. Well, I appreciate that commentary, and I obviously I think you're right. Uh, but uh, let me, you know, because one of the things that I. Todd Easter's interview with Chris Conti immediately after the verdict was was just was inappropriate. I mean, the amount of um, uh, satisfaction uh, that it brought him was not what a a, a neutral uh, person coming in would have evinced in my mind. And I'm glad that the guy called me that had been his rapist and said, I bet he didn't tell you X, Y, Z, which is how this came out. I don't know if you knew this, but this guy called me. I did. He called me in Chattanooga, in, not Chattanooga, he called me in Clarksville the next day and said, hey, listen, man, this Todd Easter guy was a victim of a 23-count uh, statutory rape indictment, and I bet he never told you this. And I said, well, how do you know this? He said, because I'm the guy <laughs> that was the defendant yeah. in that case. And, you know, and, and that's how this, I called up Nick Barris at Channel 5 and said, man, get a truck, get a truck, get a truck. <laughs> you know, let's get a truck and get on it. Because I wasn't going to let this guy really sully uh, what I had spent uh, an adult lifetime attempting to defend anyway. And Absolutely. I, I just thought, I thought his, I thought it was off-putting. I thought his reaction uh, was, was off-putting. But was there any part of that defense uh, strategy that, that, that made you curious as you watched that un, un, unfold? Um, <laughs> so maybe I need to say that because I um, am an independent uh, reporter and I don't work for, I work for myself, I, I don't always have to just be neutral in my reporting. So I'm, a, I'm what you would might like call a color commentator, a color reporter. So there are times when I'm reporting on a trial that I just throw it out there and I put all my opinions out there. Um, I don't like. I don't like. I don't like what these defendants did. I don't. Li- I don't like it at all. Right. So I did. Ha- I had. I had a hard time. Now I will say up front that I am. I really, really try to defend defense attorneys, and I've been that way my whole life because I. I love our legal system, and we have to. Ha- and we have to have both sides in there. So I've always been a very big proponent of defense attorneys because the average Joe tends to not like defense attorneys until they need one. <laughs> so, right. so I. I get. It. I get it and I know what defense attorneys are all about. So, um, but I don't like this case. I don't, I don't like it. I just don't like it. I don't like what happened that night. I, I don't like anything about it. And I really, really, really didn't like Brad, Brandon Vandenberg. I didn't like him filming it. didn't like him thinking it was funny. I didn't right. like anything about that. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if you want my opinion. <laughs> oh no, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have asked you if, if I didn't. I mean, I think it's fair game. I'm, I'm, you know, 
first of all, you understand, and your your followers may not, but you understand that you once you accept the employment, you don't get to go in there and say I give. So you you, right. you, you get that. That's not an option that a defense attorney right. has. Uh, so while my defense strategy might have been something that was that you found repulsive, which is okay, uh, it I had to come up with a defense. <laughs> I came up with the best one. You know that that I could conceive. I can't look back, Kathy. To be honest with you, I don't look back and say, "Man, I wish I'd have said this or done this." Or you know, right. I, there really isn't anything. I kind of let it all hang out. Now it wasn't successful, outside of the fact that it's now a mistrial. So I guess I won uh, because trying a case to a mistrial in a case that's that uh, uh, factually uh, disadvantaged is is something of note. But uh, but right. I can't really think of anything that I said or did that didn't need to be done in, in the in an effort to obtain a, a, a fair verdict but uh no well, you, I, you can tell me obviously I mean, look you, you defense attorneys have to play the hand they're dealt i do think that um that, that we have watched cases and we've watched some big high profile cases and my chatters will know exactly what i'm talking about right now where there have been defense attorneys, attorneys that have taken it too far and they and they're they don't need to go as far as they go and i and i do not believe that you did that yeah so i i don't think that you did that um i i think where i think where vandenberg buried himself was uh going the next day sleeping with her the next day all of that he didn't need to do that so you know i i, I don't know i i don't know uh, i i think cory Beatty's at least uh Expressed a lot of remorse. That doesn't yeah. mean that doesn't mean you know doesn't mean he's not going to have to pay for what he did. Right. But we haven't heard anything from Vandenberg. So, what did you think about whom the state chose to try? I mean, why, one of one of my defense theories was, man, why are we letting these two cats off? How is that equal, I want to ask how is that you equal about that. justice? It's, how is that equal justice? As far as the rest of us are concerned, we don't know what's happening with with Banks and McKenzie. It's very quiet on that front. So they were arraigned the other day, but why, are, why is there no trial date for them? So maybe you can enlighten us on that. Well, the way it works is they, they have a tremendous incentive to testify in a way that would make the government happy. And so they, they're not going. And I was very upset in this uh, trial that Mr. Thurman was being allowed to argue that their day is forthcoming because that is not true. Their day is not forthcoming. And to the extent that he looks at a jury and says, you know, we're still going to try these guys, that is a blatant misrepresentation. And, and, and They are not going to trial? No, they're not going to try these guys. They, You know, that's part of the deal they cut. They, they, they cut the deal with the little fish to get the big fish in their eyes. Now, what I disagree with is what they maintain is the little fish versus big fish. I don't see how Brandon Banks, for instance, I don't see how his culpability is any less than anyone else's. You, I don't either. And I don't know why you need his testimony to gain a conviction. In fact, in the trial that I conducted, they didn't call him, even though he was on the list. They didn't call him. So why is this guy getting a deal? It was, was you know, may not be a legal defense, Kathy, but, I mean, I was curious. Aren't you curious? Why is this guy getting a deal? I absolutely agree with that, and I did not know that. I did not know that part of the case that, um, that Banks is going to get completely off on that because I... 100% disagree with that. He was a major player in this. Oh, absolutely. As major as anybody. Now, I'm not saying he's going to get completely off, but he is right. going to get tremendous consideration for his participation mm -hmm. and cooperation. And I don't, I don't, like that. I don't understand. I don't either. I think a lay jury, and that's one reason that we, you know, that's why you heard me argue some of the things you heard me argue, and that's why my the theme of my closing argument was the four words that appear above the United States Supreme Court building, equal justice under law, and I asked the jury, how is this equal justice? And I don't know that that's, you know, I don't know that that altogether uh, is necessarily constitutes a defense, but I think it's, I think it's fair commentary. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's fair discussion uh, myself. And so, yeah, that that they're not going to let him completely off. But the fact that he gets consideration where uh, these these other kids do not, I don't understand how they made that determination that they needed him for this prosecution because because they have film. Right. Right. Exactly. So. That, yeah. I, yeah. And I, yeah. I don't agree with that. And uh, yeah, that makes me more mad. And I might have to write about that now. <laughs> 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 well, just you, you know, you you can 
you can mention that you came on the show and some of these issues were discussed. But uh, you know, <laughs> I'm embattled enough as it is. The, I, as, that's how I got nudged into radio. I, I'm like Jamie Dixon. I don't know if I can keep my mouth shut either uh, about some things. I mean, I'm not like Jamie in other ways, but I might be like Jamie in some ways. So uh, I'm sorry, Jamie Hood. I don't know why I'm saying Dixon. Part oops, you know, slip of the tongue. Uh, in the Hood uh, matter, kind of getting back to that. Uh, I think I got an impression from your overall reporting that you thought that uh, Ken Malden, uh, who's the district attorney and his team and his prosecution team, had done a pretty solid and thorough job uh, in the prosecution. Uh, and there were some 1,100 exhibits entered uh, over a three-week oh, period. Yeah. Yeah, so many. They have like over 1,100, and I think Jamie Hood has had like 27. <laughs> yeah, and, and they have 100 so, witnesses uh, that in, in their case in chief, the prosecution. Or yeah, more, I, think they had more, over, yeah. I think they had over 300 wow. initially listed, and they ended up calling uh, just over 100. Um, and, and so, yeah, and they, they put on a solid case. Here's the interesting part of this case. So, um, briefly... Uh, Jamie Hood, take a, a friend of his, which is a local. Everybody, everybody involved in this case deals drugs. So, a, a friend of Jamie Hood's uh, is a marijuana dealer, uh, Judon Brooks. And admittedly, he's been on the stand saying that. And Jamie calls him over to his place under the guise of, you know, come show me something about this marijuana plant. And he gets him over there, and Jamie's got three buddies that in ski masks and a gun, and says, "You tell me where this." other guy is that's a, a local drug dealer and Brooks is like I don't know I don't know and they hog tie him up with um, they hog tie him up and put him in the trunk of a car you know Brooks right. and they're taking him down the road and he escapes out of the trunk and gets away and he calls 911 and says Jamie Hood kidnapped me so that puts Jamie Hood on the run that day and there's an all points bulletin out and they're looking for him and that's how he comes across the first police officer and Jamie Hood gets out of the car and runs toward Officer Howard, who's sitting in his car, and he just shoots him in his car. Officer Howard survives that shooting, but as Jamie's running away from Officer Howard's car, he comes upon Officer Christian, who, by the way, is on a phone call with a citizen who's complaining about getting ripped off by a mechanic. And she's going on and on and on. We heard the call being played. On and on and on. This is a small town, Athens, Georgia. Right. I don't know why this poor, poor police officer is having to take this call. She needs to be on with the Better Business Bureau. Going on and on and on and on and on. And he it starts to run past the car, witnesses say, because they have testified, and looks like, oh, there is a police officer in that car. He takes a few steps back and just shoots Officer Christian through a closed, his closed window in the car and kills him. So that's a total just assassination right there. Officer Christian wasn't even looking at Jamie Hood, didn't even see him, didn't have his gun out or anything. And, of course, it's um, Jamie Hood's position that, well, it was kill or be killed. I mean, that's what he, he keeps that. saying. Yeah, it's kill, It was kill or be killed. And takes off, and then there's a four-day manhunt. So that's what that is. He admits to killing. He admits to shooting those two police officers. He says, you know, it was it was me or them. It was justification. Yada yada. We have a history with the police officers. Officer Howard was a jailer at the jail when I was incarcerated years before that, and and we had a run in then. And so I knew he'd be after me. So that's that. But four months prior. Another drug dealer associate, associate was killed in his driveway, and that was an unsolved murder. Well, when Kathy, Jamie Hood is on the Kathy, run... we're going to have to take a break right there. Okay, we'll okay. be back on the other side with more from Kathy Russin on Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version. There is a name in the Clarksville community we have come to associate with excellence in legal services. That name is Kimberly Turner and Associates, the attorneys who care. There are times in life when reliance on attorneys who care is particularly critical. Family strife is definitely among those times, whether it be divorce, child custody, juvenile delinquent petitions, alimony or child support increases, or any type of strife which invades our personal lives. Kim Turner and Associates are the attorneys who care. Call Kim today at 570 570- Two one one three four, or get an appointment. Perhaps you just stop by her place located at 130 Franklin Street next to the Black Horse. That's 572-1134. Kimberly Turner and Associates are the attorneys who care. Something strange in the 
neighborhood. Man, bugs, termites, snakes, wild animals really creep me out. Just can't live with them. That's why I call Robards Pest Control at 931-645-6099. I am on the quarterly pest control service plan at my house. It was an initial payment of $70, then it's just $35 thereafter every three months with no contract. Hey, it's 100% guaranteed. Robards Pest Control offers termite and moisture control and is a state-licensed wildlife trapper. Wish I had known that when I had to deal with the snake my daughter found in the linen closet at my house. Robards Pest Control, 931-645-6099. Dealing with the creepy, crawly, slithery, disgusting problems so you don't have to. Robards Pest Control, 931-645-6099. Hey, it's a fact. Bad things happen to good people. DUI, assault, driving on revoke, domestic disputes, or any other charges. Clarksville Bonding has been in business for over 30 years and will be there for you. Call Hannah Christie or Mark Grant, 801-3535. When you need us, that's Clarksville Bonding, Hannah Christie or Mark Grant, 801-3535. Two words come to mind readily when discussing the law firm of Meeks & Meeks, affordable and skilled. These guys will come immediately to your aid when you most need them. They spring to your defense aggressively before the ink even dries on the criminal warrant. Meeks & Meeks, located at 137 Franklin Street in Clarksville, Tennessee, may be reached at 645-3888 and may likewise be found on the second floor of the Montgomery County Courthouse anytime it's open, excellently displaying the professional skill and aptitude we have come to expect from a Meeks. 645-3888 gets Meeks and Meeks the first step towards solving your problems. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. <laughs> Okay, we're back on Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version. We've got Kathy Russin on from Utah, who is a national correspondent on high-profile criminal defense trials and reporter, has her own uh, uh, .com and courtchatter.com where you can get the news uh, on ongoing cases. She covers all the big ones, has covered me before, and uh, is covering right now the Jamie Hood cop killer case, and we were just discussing that at the break, and then I've got some questions from some listeners to ask again, but go ahead, Kathy. Uh, I was just trying to quickly, this case is so convoluted that I couldn't do it so quickly, about the state's case saying that um, they, they finally were able to tie him into this murder that was four months prior to the cop shootings and he's because while, too. He's while he, he yeah. was on the run um, uh, for four days after the cop shootings, he ends up at the apartment building of some associates uh, in an apartment where he holds them hostage. And during that day and a half, he talks about shooting and killing this Amari Ray four months earlier. And had he not done that, that case is very weak. There's, there is only thing tying him to that shooting. That shooting had gone unsolved for four months. Nobody knew who had shot and killed Amari Ray in his driveway, um, except he, Jamie Hood, who loves to talk, started talking um, that day when he was held up in this apartment building um, that he had killed Amari Ray, who, by the way, he'd attended his funeral. He was an honorary pallbearer at his funeral, um, but it's tied to this this day of the cop shooting because, remember, he had kidnapped his buddy Judon Brooks right. because he, would, he wouldn't tell him where big-time drug dealer Bayotta Campbell was. Four months earlier, he'd gone to Amari Ray's house looking for big-time drug dealer Kenyatta Campbell. And that's how prosecutors were able to argue and tie it together and have him tried for both these murders in the same trial, is that it was all tied together. But they, forensically, they found the same shell casing that was at the crime scene of Omari Ray they found in Jamie Hood's Cadillac that was used the day of 
Judon Brooks kidnapping the day of the police shootings. So that's the only physical evidence that ties him to the murder scene of Omari Ray. That's it. That's the only physical evidence except Jamie Hood's mouth when he admitted to the hostages who have now testified in court that he was bragging about the day that he shot and killed Omari Ray. Kind of is reminiscent to take you back a few years, but somewhat reminiscent of Perry March and the extent to which while in custody he made certain incriminating statements to people to whom he didn't need to be talking in the first place. Yeah, well, you know, defendants and criminals aren't always very smart. Yes, you're, you're you're right, Kathy. That's one of the most big. That's one of the biggest misnomers is the degree to which people engaged in criminal enterprise are sophisticated about the system. It, it's right. it's really not. They're not really as sophisticated as as people like to portray them, and they make mistakes that are rather rookie. I mean, you would think that Jamie Hood had a pretty extensive uh, background, and and uh, I mean, obviously he feels comfortable enough in the system to represent himself in a capital case. Uh, right. but, but they still make mistakes that are that are ones that you would figure someone that was unsophisticated would make. Right. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Here's a question. I, I promise you I get these questions. I know that some of them sound like they're written by my mother, but they're, they're not. Uh, one of my listeners wants to know, what did you think about the quality of the closing argument I gave in the Manny Rape case? Oh, well... Look, you, you, you're a quali quality attorney, so you, your mother. Are you sure that wasn't your mother? I, I know, Kathy. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I felt badly coming out of my mouth. I thought, well, there's no way that this doesn't sound like a set-up question, but I promise it's not. But I don't know why this person wants to know this. I, they're probably hoping you'll badmouth me, but go ahead. No. Um, I thought... I thought the um, closing arguments were, real, were done really well. As a matter of fact, I thought that uh, he had great representation, quite frankly. Um, I also thought, <laughs> I thought it was an enjoyable trial. Some people find that a strange comment. People that are not what I call trial watchers find the whole trial watching thing odd, but um, it's it's very enjoying. It's a, it's very enjoying to watch, especially when you have um, personalities, like characters, what I call them, in the courtroom, and you're one of the, you're you're one of the personalities in the courtroom to watch, uh, and you deliver a closing argument that's that's fascinating to watch that that catches the jurors' attention. You have them you have them paying attention. Um, I I don't know. Like I said, it's a hard. It was a hard case to defend. So you know, you can only work with what you had. I, I that, there was no doubt in my mind they were going to come back with a guilty. So I that, I don't know. If that's any reflect. That's any reflection on his attorneys. It's just that it, it, the case was what it was. I think they're going to get they're going to get the exact same result the next time around. Well, it, you know, it's reset for November 30, so I guess I'll be tuning in this next time. You let me know if you want any analysis. Uh, <laughs> okay, also, there, I will. <laughs> somebody has written in, I watched Fletcher bow tie in parentheses long for the first time on Court TV. What happened to Court yeah. TV? Why was it taken off? It had millions of viewers and great legal analysts, but we are glad to know that your site has come along to take its place. So what happened yeah, to Court TV? Um, I have talked to many um, of the uh, attorneys and legal analysts and commentators that were involved in Court TV, um, and one uh, different people came along that were in charge of that channel, and then they decided to go and do different pro types of programming. Another um, commentary I got about that was it's very, it was very difficult to do. It was very expensive, first of all, to go around and do those trials. It was a lot of setup and all of the um, satellite they had to do, and a, a lot of money went into that. Also, for advertising, it was difficult. It was difficult to do commercial breaks when you're covering live trials. It was difficult for sponsors because depending on the content of the trial, to get pre determine sponsors, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to get some kind of, you know, diaper ad, you're going to get some kind of, um, it, the whole thing, it was difficult. Um, and so, and it, a lot of money went into covering trials to have all those people out at the remote locations. Um, 
And I, I think it wasn't a big money maker like people thought that it was. And so they, the people, the head people there decided it wasn't, that it wasn't. And so they went off in the middle of the first Jody Arias trial. So the sister station, HLN, decided to pick it up with what they called in session to at least finish off Jody Arias. And so they had six hours of that going a day. Um, and they decided to do one more hope high profile case in Martin McNeil, which is right here locally for me, Utah. And um that's actually when Court Chatter was born. That's when I um up the website was for Martin McNeil and so I attended every day of that trial. And that was the last one they decided to do. They came in here, they they did, they covered Martin McNeil and got completely out of the business. It that wasn't what where they wanted their programming to go. I I, it was sad for me personally, you know, many, many years ago. That's who I watched. That's what I loved to do. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's ever coming back on TV. And that portion of the uh, pedophilia case brought to you by Johnson & Johnson Diapers. Yeah, right. You, you know, right? You, you had some natural <laughs> advertising that could have been done there that, uh, <laughs> you know, would have been, uh, you know, different. Um, I've got another listener that says he is mighty glad to know about court chatter. Uh, he says that he is a big enthusiast uh, of this type of uh, programming, and and he is is glad to know that he can tune in. Uh, and I think I I don't want to. I mean, it's a free site, it, it isn't it? Oh yeah, well, absolutely. That's, that, that, that's that's a tremendous. Now, let me tell you this. I I want to tell you this story because uh, you know I had a, a, a nickname when I was. Uh, trial uh, practitioner called the Bowtie Killer, which is the name of the uh, rap song that brought us on air. It you know, was written to about me uh, uh, by uh, an artist. Well, anyway, uh, I got that nickname because uh, when I was trying cases in outlying counties, like in Holly Bobo, for instance, like when you're in Decatur County, which I don't know if you know where that is, Kathy, but that's really out in the middle of nowhere. But right. I, was, I was trying a case in a county similar to, actually it touched Decatur County, and it was a jury trial, and people, elderly people, would come to court and watch the the trial for the theater, particularly if it was being defended by someone that they wanted to see, you know, and I'd gotten a right. lot of coverage, and so they'd come out and watch it. Well, I was walking out the back of the courthouse, and um, this, old, this little old lady, just lovely woman, probably about 90 would be my guess, you know, of course it is. Camden, she could have been 30, you know, I mean, who knows. But anyway, she she looked like she was an elderly woman, and as I was walking out the back of the courthouse, she went, there he is, the bow tie killer. And, and people started calling me that, so when I went in to get hired by Jason Autry, I went in, I had to go into the, uh, the secure death row portion of the Tennessee prison to, to meet with him, and they wouldn't let me meet with him privately. And when I went back there, of course, you know, I got everybody back here in the prison was trying to hire me. <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, Mr. Long, you know, every day where I went, you know, I, I mean, I got about 12 cells trying to call me over. But I went to meet with him. And I said, son, do, do you know who I am? Because your family's asked me to come talk to you. And he said, yes, sir. You the bow tie killer. <laughs> and I said, well, let's let's hope you're not the bow bow killer. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's, kind, that's kind of how that initiated. And I know that sounds right but you know when you when you do this for a living you know you 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 can be you can divorce yourself from personal feelings you know when it's your living you know well, i think you have to as a defense attorney i mean don't you i mean you're you're either going to do that or you're not going to give them a defense which the right. constitution doesn't permit you know I hey, mean, you have there to give are them a many many trial watchers who are not fans of defense attorneys and i i always feel like i have to defend defense attorneys because we have to have defense attorneys people and there are innocent people that go to trial there are innocent people so if if you you have to have defense attorneys you also have to have both sides represented in a courtroom or we are not we are we don't have our legal system so this is what we have to do this is what has to happen and you want a defense attorney if you're accused of something so um, this is this is what we have. So uh, you know, I'm a defender of defense attorneys. Let me ask you this question: A case that you're going to be covering, I know, is the Charleston massacre case, as it's been Absolutely. dubbed. Absolutely, uh, Dylan Roof. Uh, what what kind of defense? I mean, it seems to me like that this case factually is as much of a defense disadvantage as I maybe have ever seen. 
He's either going to just go guilty and hope uh, for some kind of plea deal, or he's going to have to go insanity. What what else is he going to do? Well, and and let's talk about that for a second because I'm not sure what the uh, diminished capacity or insanity defense in South Carolina is, but in in Tennessee. Uh, that you have to be able to show that they were so far gone that they could not appreciate the criminality of their conduct. Right. And this Dylan Roof has made comment that he uh, almost uh, didn't follow through with it because they were so nice to him. Right. In fact, Dylan he got there for an hour and did Bible study with them. And and so in a case where he almost makes an expression that it was wrong. It's going to be hard to argue that he was in a mental state sufficient to render him incapable of determining whether the conduct was criminal. Again, like we saw in the other case we were just talking about in Jamie Hood, a, 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 an unfortunate, for the defense at least, expression. Pretty common in, in, in the cases that you cover, isn't it? Look, yeah... Well, you know, you know better than anyone how rare that is an insanity defense is. Okay, that a ex- successful insanity defense is. It, you know, the legal definition of insanity, and it varies from from state to state. It's very hard, very, very, very hard to to prove, and and then you know, it's sw- the burden pr- switches over to the defense at that point. Look, this guy, this guy had a website. This guy hated black people. And wanted to get rid of them, and this was nothing more than hate. And so I, I don't know that he has. He, what, what defense is he going to have? But what is that? What, what attorney? What is, what is an attorney going to get up there and say? You're not born with hate. Well, you're know. you're right. I mean, it's. I'll tell you this: he's going to have to get up there and say something. Well, obviously, I mean, but. he's he's not going to get to say you're right. This guy's an animal. Let's let's do away with him. That that would be ineffective assistance of counsel, which would right. give him a second trial anyway. Uh, that that's not what the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution contemplates. But it is going to be difficult, Kathy. It, it it is, isn't it? I mean, it's it's really, you know, I'm kind of scratching my head. I I was able to come up with some pretty uh, inventive defenses through the years, some of which I thought had a chance many of which I knew really didn't, but they were the best that I had. And there's a, Do you find covering national trials that there's a level of self-delusion in which a criminal defense attorney has to engage in order to be effective? Well, <laughs> yes. And, and is, is there's a, there's, it, well, I mean, I guess I should ask you, but isn't there like a, only tell me so much kind of attitude. Yes, you, I mean, I, yeah. don't, you know, I, I don't. I don't need to know everything. Just answer my questions and only my questions. Right, and and you know, Kathy, okay. I want to say this too. When you're consulting with someone, they don't come in and say, "Hey, man, I did it, but get me off." I mean, right. I, I, you're you're the last person that they will come out to, if you will, because they right. need, they need you to believe in them. Right. And you know that, and people hate that too. But it's all it's all a necessary part. Yes, we'd like to think that everyone that's guilty just needs to plead guilty and and be put away. And that's that's just not the reality. It's not the, it's not the reality out there. I, I was I was like that as well. You know, guilty people need to pay for their crimes. But I guess there's different levels of uh, consequences and different levels of pay of quote pay for your crimes. And uh, that's what defense attorneys are for. Nobody wants to see a, a guilty ple- person go completely free and not ever pay for their crimes. Um, but there are different levels of justice, and that's what you know. That's what they need representation for. Well, Kathy, but, that's uh, our, that's yeah. our hour break. Any chance you can okay. bleed over into the next hour a little bit? Um, look, I'm going to get strung up if I don't <laughs> get back to the hood trial. All right, and continue tweeting. If if you're if your show wasn't directly during court hours, I would love to continue doing this. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. It's just inconvenient, or I'll come back when the Jamie Hood trial's over. It's, they started the defense case, and he's going to take the stand. Um, so the trial's winding down quickly. Okay. So well, I, I would, love, I I would wanna, come back another time. I don't want to stop you from that. Kathy Russin, thank you so much for coming on this show. Uh, the station appreciates it. Thank you for having me. My listeners appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for what you do to cover the trial process. 
Well, thank you. All right, that's Kathy Russin from CourtChatter.com, and we'll be back for hour number two here on Clarksville.com Realties, the long version. Since 1941, serving the public interest. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. To whom do you turn with all your wills and estates questions? 615-384-8019 gets you Ben Dean. Your loved one has died. There's really nothing you can do about that. At least you deserve the property and money your loved one intended you to have. Maybe you need help writing your will or planning estate issues. That help is a phone call away. Remember, 615-8019 gets you Ben Dean. That is 615-384-8019 gets you Ben Dean. A lot of real estate is bought and sold in Clarksville, and all of it has to be inspected and it has to be done right. It's your largest investment of your life. Do you want to leave its inspection to someone who isn't the best? Of course not. 931-980-5759 gets you the best inspection services. Call Bud Wink at 931-980-5759 to get the home you are buying or selling inspected by the best inspection services. That's 931-980-5759. The best inspection services. Services, changing the quality of home inspections one house at a time. WJZM Radio is Clarksville's only local news talk sports station. For local news and current events, WJZM Radio is Clarksville's broadcast leader. Join the newsmakers Saturday mornings with Clarksville in Review, a two-hour broadcast dedicated to updating you on the week's news and current events. Talk to the newsmakers on Clarksville in Review. Uh, one of the highest response times in the city was out in that direction. This will cut that response time. So if we're going to keep adding houses to that area, we, we've got to be able to protect them folks. We want their tax dollar. we got to be able to give them return on that tax dollar and that means putting strategically located fire stations where we can. Tune in Saturday mornings 8 until 10 on WJZM Radio. Clarksville in Review. It's what you'd expect from the station that's been all about Clarksville since 1941. WJZM Radio. Everybody is driving to Stuart Williams Furniture Company, located on 801 Memorial Boulevard in Springfield, Tennessee. They are open Monday to Saturday, 8 to 5, and boast a superlative selection in all the popular name brands at modest prices, which defy belief. Browse the selection at StuartWilliamsFurniture.net. That's S-T-E-W-A-R-T, no space, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, F-U-R-N-I-T-U-R-E, dot net. Call 615-384-7584. Stuart Williams Furniture Company in Springfield, Tennessee, where they either have or can get you everything to make your house a home. As the name Clarksville.com Realty implies, we know Clarksville and moreover, we are passionate experts in the Clarksville, Tennessee real estate market. Whether you are planning to buy a new home in Sango or sell one in the fields of North Mead, your experience should be a positive one. Our philosophy is simple. Listen first, offer guidance and suggestions, then act with confidence. Expect the following. Expert analysis of your wants and needs. Again, we must listen to you. Superior knowledge of the inventory of homes for sale in Clarksville. Masterful systems and methods that have proven themselves throughout our years of experience. A closing table full of smiles. Get started today by visiting Clarksville.com. Just one word, Clarksville.com. We know Clarksville so well, we bought it. Clarksville.com. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. <laughs> on Clarksville.com Realties, the long version. If you missed our number one, shame on you. We had Kathy Russin on from uh, CourtChatter.com, and she you, you can tweet her at Kathy at CourtChatter.com. And, uh, of course, this is Fletcher Long, and you can tweet me at Long Version Show. Some of her uh, listeners and uh, Internet uh, audience wants to know if there will be a rebroadcast of this long version, and there will be, and it'll be up later today, and you go to wjzm.com, go 
to podcast and put the long version in the search engine and you will be able to get it and get Kathy's interview in its entirety. Well, John Michael, yes, in, a, sir. in the Colorado theater shooting, James Holmes said Thursday he's chosen not to testify in oh. his death penalty trial. It's oh. another an, an, a, another death penalty case. Obviously, the athens Clark County Jamie Hood case, also a death, a death penalty case. Holmes told Judge Carlos A. Samour, Jr., that he had discussed the decision with his attorneys, responding to the judge's questions with direct yes and no answers and swiveling slightly in his chair. Had Holmes chosen to testify, prosecutors would have been able to cross-examine him. Some more determined that Holmes' decision not to testify was made voluntarily and intelligently. Those are the buzzwords. The final days of testimony have presented jurors with the pivotal question they'll have to decide whether to believe psychiatrists to say Holmes was sane or whether to believe psychiatrists to say he was insane when he opened fire in a crowded movie theater in 2012. Holmes' defense, which is expected to rest its case, called a nationally known schizophrenia expert who on Thursday defended her conclusion that Holmes was so delusional that he was unable able to tell right from wrong during the attack that killed 12 people and injured 70. Mm -hmm. Closing statements are expected uh, uh, to to go on this week. One thing I want to tell you, uh, John Michaels, you're going to hear that defense again in the Charleston massacre case. You're going to hear. Uh, I would say so. You're, you're going to hear the he was too delusional to tell right from wrong. And you know the thing about sure psychiatry, you, you would have. Uh, thought that he should not testify either if you were his defense attorney. Yeah, I, I really have never seen a criminal defendant that took the stand and helped himself. Yeah, I mean, They and, always do more harm. In, in my good. mind, uh, you know, I, I never testified in any trial uh, uh, that involved allegations of my doing poorly or wrong. Uh, uh, Joan Block at Elinda 100 just said, Court Chatter at Long Version Show, great show, Kathy. So she's already getting some support there. Hey, what about me? <laughs> anyway, Joan Block says it was a great show. Uh, great job, Kathy. And Kathy did do a great job. She did. But be ready for this line of defense in the Holmes defense in the, in the theater shooting in Colorado because you're going to see it again. Dr. Rachel Gurr, you may even see her. Dr. Raquel, Raquel Gurr saw Holmes for 28 hours in six separate meetings. She leads the Schizophrenia Research Center at the University of Pennsylvania I, and Ivy League School and is considered the star witness for the defense. She testified Thursday that Holmes didn't hate the people he shot. He was suffering from delusions that killing others would increase his self-worth. Man, that's going to be the defense. In the Charleston case, he did not feel angry. He wanted to stop the thoughts that had bothered him for years. But God, I mean, that's going to be the defense, isn't it? Prosecutors hammered at Gurr's report, accusing her over more than two days of cross-examination of everything from bad grammar to being errant by not asking certain follow-up questions or recording or recording her interviews. The psychiatrist exchanges with District Attorney George Brackler went from testy to hostile Thursday. Hmm. Brackler grilled Gurr. On leaving out some details from her written account of her Holmes interview, what you want to say is, I picked and chose what to put in the report, Brackler said. An exasperated girl replied, of course, I wrote the report, but what I put in the report was what I was trained to do. Defense attorney Daniel King characterized the prosecutor's attack as nitpicking over grammar and punctuation, but said the substance of Gurr's report stands. He asked if she would risk her reputation by giving jurors false information. She said absolutely not. But she later gave conflicting testimony about whether Holmes had ever told her that he killed to put people out of their misery. He did, but Gurr initially said that he had not. At the end of Gurr's three days on the stand, jurors peppered her with more than 58 questions, at least nine of which were about her notes and methods. The whole case depends on how reliable jurors find the more than 10 psychiatrists and psychologists who testified at some point about Holmes's mental state before and after the shootings. Holmes has pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, and in Colorado, prosecutors must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Holmes was sane when he committed his crimes. So that's a, a little bit of a departure from Colorado to here. Uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting case to watch, though. The th yeah, the, the, like, a, like Ms. Russin told us a moment ago, that, that her website has kind of taken the place of Court True, TV. Yeah, Court TV. Which, which was popular. Uh, I used to watch it a lot. I was on it yeah, with, some, I with some frequency. Uh, I used to watch it quite a bit. Uh, I, think, I think that that is going to be... Um, 
that is going to absolutely be uh, uh, the line of defense that Dylan Roof will will yeah, undertake. And, I would think so. And let me say this too uh, about psy- psychiatrists and psychologists and that type of evidence. It is not, and, and there must be, I think there's something to this, but it is not difficult to hire an expert to render a ruling in a criminal case that is consistent with your theory. Yes, I would think so. Which makes you wonder about the overall accuracy of the information that they are imparting if it is easy to find someone to arrive at the opinion you wish to pay for them to which to arrive. <laughs> you know, I, different ones, I mean, in the way people say things can be interpreted two different ways, can, too. It, it, I could say one thing and one psychologist, you know, he could say... Or you know, would say, "Well, this is what he means by this," and the other one would have a complete opposite meaning of what I just said. Well, and and you know, I love the war story, J.M. But I had a case one time where my guy was in my mind clearly, clearly crazy. I mean, he walked around Springfield, Tennessee, talking to himself. Uh, I was uh, like his seventh lawyer. And I took the case pretty much because the judge asked me to as a favor to him. Mm. He said that, you know, I can't get anybody to, yeah. to, to they, represent this They were this running guy. out of people to take. I think he punched one of his uh, lawyers uh, at a gas bay. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, that lawyer said he hit like a girl. So I guess that's, <laughs> that's good, good for the lawyer. That's good. that's good for him that he wasn't a bad dude. But anyway, he was walking around punching people. And, and I thought he was pretty clearly... Uh, crazy i mean i i didn't you know not only not only uh was he um unable to appreciate right from wrong he really wasn't able to make an appreciation of much of anything i thought it was fairly well delusional completely and was confident when the government had him evaluated by centerstone in springfield i was confident that he was going to come back uh not competent to stand trial and and they deemed him competent and that Wow. That, to me, debunked all of psychiatry. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. entire field was debunked <laughs> by that finding because it was hard for me to repose much confidence in, in any such finding again. It would be hard for him to keep that kind of act <laughs> up 24 hours a day, like an actor, you know. He, I, he is acting out. I'm acting crazy. I, I wasn't know. always... Uh, uh, I wasn't always easy to fool, but I mean, I, I was pretty surprised by that. Uh, In the Jamie Hood case, uh, the the witness that was put on by Mr. Hood is representing himself has been uh, sent out, and there's going to be a matter taken up out uh, taken up outside of their presence. So there's going to there's some evidentiary Uh -uh. uh, ruling being sought there, and uh, fascinated uh, by the Jamie Hood uh, defense, in as much as it's a death penalty case, which is the highest penalty that can be imposed by law. And he's representing himself because he doesn't believe that there's anybody else that would have his interest at heart and didn't sell him out. And and, and that's a common, uh, really, John Michael, that, that, that's pretty commonly. Yeah, I would think it is. There, There's a lot of criminal defendants out there that believe that their trial counsel is, quote unquote, selling them out. Yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't mean that. They're not, they're not for me. I, I don't, I don't, and, and to be honest, in, in the many years that I practiced law, I really didn't run across uh, really any lawyers who were consciously in league with the with the government or selling anybody out. I really believe that that lawyers out there provide uh, the best defense that they yeah. can muster with the facts that they are dealt, and they use their considerable skill and knowledge in order to arrive at a defense. Yeah. And, yeah, I don't think and, so. and I, I, I really believe that. Now, there are obviously there are some, uh, there are some practitioners of any craft that are better than others. I assume there's a few good ones, good people in there somewhere. There's some people, as Donald Trump would say, as, as I Donald, I, and I would assume some are good. Some are uh, good. There are some lawyers that that are unable to think outside the box, and I think in some defenses, particularly in high-profile defenses. You know, one of the cases, and this guy was a Clarksvillian, uh, I won one of the wooded rapist trials. Uh, the jury came back with an attempt as opposed to the whole enchilada, which was very definitely a win uh, there yeah. with those facts. And uh, that 
the one difference between the Jamie Hood trial and, and, and the Vandy case that, that I tried was the jury in the Jamie Hood trial is sequestered. They've been brought in from somewhere else and are not able to watch uh, newscasts. Yeah, like the ones in the Vanderbilt trial were not. They were going home, yeah. and, uh, and I believe watching uh, news broadcasts, I, I don't know that how anybody could uh, ever say they weren't. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how, you, you know, besides the fact of cutting out their TV and any access to the Internet or radio, when they got home, I don't know how you would keep them from doing that. What do you think about uh, Kathy Russon's impression of the appropriateness of Monty Watkins' ruling? Because I think you could hear, I don't know if you could or not, but I think you could hear that she probably is a bit pro-government leaning in uh, defense and in criminal cases. Yes, yes. I, now she she made a, a little. she made a real effort to uh, say that she does stand up for attorneys and understands their role, and I yes. think she does. Let me say there's first, probably some things that goes on, you know, that she doesn't like. You know. Well, let me just say this, okay? For everybody that watches a trial on television, follows the coverage, that finds themselves leaning in the government's favor, I do not blame you. I, I under I understand. Uh, most people are are good people who have uh, a hope that people that do wrong things will pay for their wrongs in an appropriate manner. I I don't think that makes you a bad person. I just think that if you're going to serve on a jury, you have to entertain at least the notion that this person didn't do it at least initially, yeah. until you are swayed by the weight of the proof. And that's what I think is not happening. That That's that's my criticism. So, uh, Kathy Russon's perspective that sometimes she gets upset with some of the defenses uh, that are proffered, I don't take issue with that. I, I understand that she yeah. does, and I could see why she would. But she did say, without defense lawyers... But we'd be in big trouble. She does understand that there is nothing wrong with a defense lawyer yeah. proffering a defense. Yeah, because that's what they're supposed to do. That's she said that she feels like that some defense lawyers go too far. Mm. She said that she did not feel uh, that anything that we did in in our case that that she covered went too far, which uh, which I appreciate. Yeah, and 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 I want to comment on that too because a defense lawyer goes too far. When he um, employs a defense that he knows is not either factually or legally appropriate, mm, yeah, that that that's in my mind that's the line. That's, the line in the that's sand. stepping over the line. That's stepping over the line. I think that every. I think anything that, for instance, you know, a jury is the is the finder of fact. And the exclusive judges of the law under the court's direction. Now, the court gives its direction when they hand them jury instructions. That's, right. that, that's the direction. Yeah. But how they apply those instructions to the facts is the sole purview of the jury. And to the extent that you can argue to a jury reasonable inferences that could be drawn from the facts before them, that's just good legal practice. Yeah. And that is entirely appropriate for a, a defense lawyer to do. Yeah, to, and, I mean, and to and instill for, doubt in their mind. And for the government to do. So there's nothing wrong. I don't think a lawyer goes too far when they say, okay, these were the facts that came into the record, and if you apply the court's instruction, this is how I think you should view this. Yeah. I think that's an entirely appropriate argument, an entirely constitutional argument. Uh, Just like the uh, glove in the O.J. Simpson trial. You know, I can remember people saying how ridiculous that was. You well, know? But I thought it was a great move, you I, know. I, I'm going to tell you. it was simple, you know. I want to talk about the glove thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, ta I tell you what, I'd be better able to take this up on the other side All of the right. break. You're listening to Clarksville.com Realties, the long version here on WJZM. Man, bugs, termites, snakes, wild animals really creep me out. Just can't live with them. That's why I call Robards Pest Control at 931-645-6099. I am on the quarterly pest control service plan at my house. It was an initial payment of $70, then it's just $35 thereafter every three months with no contract. Hey. 
it's 100% guaranteed. Robards Pest Control offers termite and moisture control and is a state-licensed wildlife trapper. Wish I had known that when I had to deal with the snake my daughter found in the linen closet at my house. Robards Pest Control, 931-645-6099. Dealing with the creepy, crawly, slithery, disgusting problems so you don't have to. Robards Pest Control, 931-645-6099. Hey, it's a fact. Bad things happen to good people. DUI, assault, driving or revoke, domestic disputes, or any other charges. Clark's Full Bonding has been in business for over 30 years and will be there for you. Call Hannah Christie or Mark Grant, 801-3535. When you need us, that's Clark's Full Bonding, Hannah Christie or Mark Grant, 801-3535. Two words come to mind readily when discussing the law firm of Meeks & Meeks, affordable and skilled. These guys will come immediately to your aid when you most need them. They spring to your defense aggressively before the ink even dries on the criminal warrant. Meeks & Meeks, located at 137 Franklin Street in Clarksville, Tennessee, may be reached at 645-3888 and may likewise be found on the second floor of the Montgomery County Courthouse anytime it's open, excellently displaying the professional skill and aptitude we have come to expect from a Meeks. 645-3888 gets Meeks and Meeks the first step towards solving your problems. Your one-stop shop for sports talk. Sports talk. Make sure to tune in every Monday and Thursday from 4 to 6 p.m. for Greg Walker's Sports Talk. It's down to earth sports conversation right here on WJZM and WVRY. Something strange in the neighborhood. Man, bugs, termites, snakes, wild animals really creep me out. Just can't live with them. That's why I call Robards Pest Control at 931-645-6099. I am on the quarterly pest control service plan at my house. It was an initial payment of $70, then it's just $35 thereafter every three months with no contract. Hey, it's 100% guaranteed. Robards Pest Control offers termite and moisture control and is a state-licensed wildlife trapper. Wish I had known that when I had to deal with the snake my daughter found in the linen closet at my house. Robards Pest Control, 931-645-6099. Dealing with the creepy, crawly, slithery, disgusting problems so you don't have to. Robards Pest Control, 931-645-6099. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. I'm alright, nobody but about me. Why you got to give me a fight? Can't you just let it be? I know I'm alright. We are back here on Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version. On WJZM, you can tweet us at Long Version Show. You can Facebook us at The Long Version. You can call us at 931-645-6414. We had on in the first hour Kathy Russin from CourtChatter.com, which is the, uh, uh, the heir to Court Television. And yes. uh, she came on here that, and talked about some of the national news stories of uh, Court that she has been covering. Uh, my phone has been going off. <laughs> I mean, the Twitter has gone nuts with all of her followers, which she has by the hundreds of thousands uh, that are blowing it up because they wanted to hear uh, her interview, which you can catch later when it goes up on podcast. Oh, yeah. It'll be a very short thing. John Michaels, when we went to break, you were talking about the glove, the glove. episode, and I really yes. want to—I I, want to talk about that because I can remember how people, you know, reacted to that. Why that's so stupid? You know, why is he doing that for? It? First of all, I have no clue uh, why F. Lee Bailey was on that defense team, other than to to other, be a name. Other than he was a name, and you know, he he really, you know, ex marine and was well thought of, but. F. Lee Bailey's uh, inclusion in that defense team seemed to be rather gratuitous in my mind. But Johnny Cochran was the main trial attorney on that defense team. Barry Sheck was uh, the technical guy that attacked the scientific proof. Yes, I was going to throw out the uh, admiration card one day because I know in the last few weeks that you've been on the air, there's been one person 
that you said that if he sat down here and you had to interview him, you would be nervous. I'd be nervous. It was Johnny Cochran. That's right. And, That's and correct. I knew, you I knew, correct, sir. I knew, I knew Johnny Cochran, and Johnny Cochran was just a fantastic trial attorney. I don't know that he was any better than Lionel Barrett, but he was he, he was, was, yeah, he he was fantastic. And Johnny Cochran told me one time, he said, you know, Fletcher, when we went into the trial, he was, he was up here in Nashville in federal court trying a case against Vanderbilt for a couple of black doctors who took their kid in to be treated for bruising and stuff and Vanderbilt concluded because they were black because they were black was was, Co was, was Cochran's uh, theory uh -huh. that, that there had been child abuse yeah. and these weren't just your normal people uh -huh. black or white they were both very successful and professional people anyway very well off they were very well off and I mean that's not to mean that you can't beat a kid you can beat a kid at any economic income level but I'm just telling you what Johnny Cochran's theory was so anyway so I was talking to, to Mr. Cochran who I did not know as Johnny, but I was talking to Mr. Cochran, and he said... I would call him that, too. Yeah, and, and he said, you know, Fletcher, when we went into trial, our theory was, if you cannot trust the messenger, you cannot trust his message. And I had that theory because we knew going in, for instance, that the medical examiner had not worn gloves because we had the video that was shot of him handling key pieces of evidence without gloves. We knew he was going to say that he was wearing gloves yeah. because, you know, we saw the police reports. Yeah. And so that was going, you know, you can't trust that messenger. We knew that uh, Furman was a racist. You know, yeah. I, I, he said, you know, Furman was a Los Angeles police detective. I was a Los Angeles criminal defense attorney. This and I'm first sure time. he had run into him before. It wasn't the first time I'd ever yeah. cross-examined Mark Furman, and I knew that Mark Furman was a racist. And we knew that he was going to deny having ever used the N-word, and we knew that he had. And we knew that we could prove that he had. So that was the second trap. He said, the, the, what fell out of the sky, the defense that fell out of the sky was, has become the most famous defense proffered, maybe in legal history, but certainly in this case, and that was, if the gloves don't fit, you must quit. Must quit. What Johnny Cochran told me, which was consistent with what I viewed, because everybody watched that on court, court TV. Who did? The, the predecessor to Court Chatter. No, I was glued to it. Glued to it. And what Johnny Cochran said happened almost mid-trial was the prosecutor representing the people of the state of California elected, curiously, to have a demonstration of O.J. Simpson putting on these gloves that they found <laughs> that they believed would tie yeah. him to the murder scene. The problem was is they never asked him to put them on before he tried them on in front of the jury. And uh, he tried to put these gloves on, and they did not fit. He could not get his hands in, in these the gloves. gloves. Well, then Christopher Darden, who was the one whose brainchild this was for the people of California, <laughs> who, who's made cameos in movies and written yeah. books and become famous. Uh, Christopher Darden, he became famous for amounting uh, for, for uh, you know, doing one of the dumbest moves in the history of trial practice. <laughs> and if he would like to sue me, I will accept <laughs> service. Anyway, um, he, out. he wanted to then put on an expert to testify that drug that that gloves shrink shrinkage you know yeah because they were that, leather gloves they were I leather think. gloves and he I wanted to, he that. wanted to call an expert to talk about why they wouldn't fit well Lance Ito who was the presiding judge in that case yes. said I'm not going to allow you in essence to rebut uh, a demonstration that you started that that, you, that was yeah, your yeah. that was your creation yeah. you know you you were the one. That that, ar that arranged the demonstration. You were the one that asked that he be made to put the gloves on in front of the jury, and uh, so and of course everybody at that time was very upset over the internet. Uh, was there an internet then? There might not have been. An I don't remember when Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. I, I think there might have been. I think that was in the infancy of dial-up, I believe. But I mean, everybody I was upset that Judge Ito did not allow. I thought Judge Ito outside of allowing things to go on way too long, I thought uh, Judge yeah. Ito conducted a fair trial and that any criticism that he drew was undeserved. And I'd love to have Lance Ito on. I wonder if I could get... I'm, yeah. you, know, with, you know, I'm riding high when I can get on people from uh, Utah to come on for an hour. and Might I could have had her for two if it wasn't for the James... You know, understand... I would she, like to hear his take. I'd love... But know. I thought that he conducted a fair trial. But anyway... Uh, then when he wouldn't let Darden put on this rebuttal proof, well, of course, you know, Darden, you don't get to rebut your own proof. You know, you, you were the one uh, that, that tried to put it on and it didn't fit. And that's when Johnny Cochran came up with, if the gloves don't fit, you must quit. And that's 
from where that uh, defense uh, originated. Uh, if Darden doesn't ask the court to require O.J. Simpson in a theatrical moment on television, and it may have been because TV was covering it, but if he doesn't ask the court, Your Honor, the, the people of California is asking the court to require O.J. Simpson to stand up in front of this jury and put on these gloves. If he doesn't do that, you don't hear the, if the gloves don't fit. Yeah. yeah. That line would have never been used. Now I'm going to do something I have never really done. I'm going to defend Darden. Oh, ooh. All right. Because Johnny right. Cochran was a sharp guy. And if Christopher Darden does... It inter First of all, he maybe shouldn't have introduced the gloves at all. But now most prosecutors cannot resist introducing a piece of physical evidence that they believe to yeah, somebody Because they had the they, blood on them. They can't yeah. help it. Yeah. They, they got blood on them. They found the crime scene. They introduced the gloves. If he if he doesn't ask O.J. Simpson to put on those gloves, Johnny Cochran would have added to the if you don't trust the messenger, you can't trust this message, he would have added the following. If Mr. you know, why didn't Mr. Darden, ladies and gentlemen, why didn't he? They have the burden of proof, it's their burden to prove it. He's asking you to guess that these gloves would fit, but yet he never asked my client to stand up and put them on. Why? Well, you can infer the only inference you're allowed to make from that is the fact that they wouldn't have fit. That is the inference. The court, the court, you know, they, they could have made him try them on. They could have made him try them on the entire time that he was in custody, the entire time awaiting trial. They could have made him try it on the entire year this trial was ongoing. You know, and, 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 and the fact that they didn't ask him to try it on, you can conclude they wouldn't have fit. And if the gloves don't fit, you must quit. He could have gotten to it that way. <laughs> or he could have said, you know, that makes Mr. Darden a questionable relator because he didn't give you evidence he easily could have. And he's another messenger in the line of messengers that you should not trust and therefore should not trust his message. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So that was one of those, you know, darned if you do. I'm going to say darned. Is that one of those Carl, uh, uh, George, George Carlin words? No, that, I think you can say that one. That's a darned if you do, darned if you don't moment. And, yes. And, and that is Very why... Much. And I think that, you know, I, I, any listeners that want to ever take me to challenge on a high-profile case and why something was done, please, you know, send the question in. I am uh, uh, almost uniquely capable to answer such such inquiries, you know. So you, you've got an opportunity here to ask that question, and, and if you want to ask it, you can ask it. Uh, but that is really, O.J. Simpson was probably the first trial that was covered to the extent uh, nationally that any trial has has uh, been been covered in in those mediums. Now there were other big trials before then. The Scopes Monkey trial, huge trial, covered by every national newspaper in the country. wasn't any TV in those days, but you know yeah. it was covered by every medium that uh, permitted coverage. And you know prior to to the advent of television and now the internet. John Michaels, your, your your coverage was was print media coverage. Yes, that's correct. Before the TV. You know, now I tried a case in Kentucky that was a murder case that the press up in Kentucky dubbed the cousin murder case, and that was a heavily, heavily, heavily at least locally covered case in the Western Kentucky area by print media and radio. Yeah. I mean, every time I went to trial or went to court in that case, uh, I would be interviewed by a uh, uh, radio. Yeah, about what was going on in that trial. About that case. That case garnered zero coverage in the Nashville television market. I, I never understood why, because it was a coverable case. It was a sexy, coverable case. I mean, it, it, it had everything you wanted. There was a death. There was unrequited love. There was one woman dumping one dude for another. <laughs> you know, they were cousins. They were family. Uh -oh. You know, that 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 case. You, kissing I would have thought. I would have thought. Yeah, the kissing cousin case. I would have thought that that case would have drawn a lot of coverage, and and it and it really didn't. So there were times when I'd have high profile cases that I thought would be high profile that ended up not being, and then I had other cases that kind of blew into a big coverage case that I didn't think would would have never thought. I re I represented a little a pee wee football coach one time that was accused of committing a crime in a um, in a road rage incident. And man, oh man, that drew. Uh, uh, Nashville was interested in that case. I mean, I, I gave that. I was interviewed by several of the media markets, uh, media outlets in in Nashville about that case. 
And I thought, man, this is nothing more than a road rage incident between a, a Clarksville resident and a guy that just happens to be a Pee Wee football coach, which doesn't really make him, you know, it doesn't make him an SEC caliber, you know, football uh, knowledge. But And that was a case that when the media came up to me and said, hey, you know, we'd like to interview you about your defense of this guy, I was, frank, frankly, I was kind of surprised. We've got a caller. You're on Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version here on WJZM. Hey, Fletcher, this is Wally Cross. Hello, doctor. How are you doing? Uh, my question concerns the Casey Anthony uh, trial. I thought the prosecution overcharged her. And w w in your opinion, what part or what role do you think she played in her daughter's death? Well, uh, they never well, explained that. I mean, they, they, I guess they didn't have to, but they, they, the decision left me kind of baffled. Uh, who, who, who did kill the child? Well, I'll tell you, I was kind of surprised, uh, too. Uh, uh, I thought that Baez uh, really did a fine job in that yeah. case. And I think that in over... Now, Jose Baez became a rock star for the defense that he mounted in uh, Casey Anthony's case. And, of course, Casey Anthony, it, it, she, was, she was very, very attractive. Uh, Nick Gordon has now hired that same lawyer uh, who's a... Uh, famous, yes. famous guy. He's hired Jose Bias, and Bias is a good choice. There were a lot of stuff that Bias did during that defense, uh, Doctor Cross, that I thought was was unwise, but but it worked. <laughs> I mean, you know, when it works, it works. You know, it works. Yeah. Um, I think that the 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 uh, government of Florida in that case did overcharge her, and that's how they ended up losing it all. That that was my opinion. And you can do that as a government. You can, and they tend to overcharge. They will tend, they will tend. That that is the tendency is to overcharge and charge a, a multiple indictment in the hopes that the jury will will conclude in a in a trial of all the offenses at once that well they might not have done this but they obviously did something or there wouldn't be this many charges which is as we've discussed. That is an impermissible inference for a jury to make, but it's one that they're likely to make anyway. I have no idea um, who uh, really uh, was guilty of that crime. I mean, uh, the question was never answered, and uh, I realize this is Jose Baez's job, but he ruined the reputation of a father. I don't blame a father for never speaking to her again. Yeah, well, and that was a defense that he kind of had to engage, in which he had to engage. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was an unfortunate uh, uh, defense where he kind of he kind of put it all on the dad, didn't he? It I sure mean, did, he, he, without any proof at all. It was all inference. Uh, yeah, and, but you know, uh, Baez is a guy, and and he's a very good lawyer. And like like I said, I thought much of his defense was unwise. But you know, what do I know? I mean, he will he clearly well, it, it seemed he, he was so far out that it worked. Yeah, it 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 almost yeah it almost that's exactly right. It was so far out there that it worked. It caused a, a doubt. But I'll tell you what Baez did better than anything else in that case was he obviously seated the right jury. Yeah. That is a fairly, although I don't know how, con was that trial in Miami is what I recall? Uh, I believe that's right. Now, if I'm you, not sure if it was in Dade County or not. It may have been. I don't know where it was held. I've forgotten. Well, the reason I I'm, the reason I mention that is overall because of the amount of retirees in Florida that can be a pretty conservative jury pool. Yeah. But now, if you're going to see a and and I'm and I don't care what your politics are, trying a case to a bunch of Republicans is is not good work for defense attorneys. I'm I'm sorry. I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, this is somebody that tried over two <laughs> criminal jury trials to verdict. Oh, I agree. I would I would take my father off a jury. And he is my father. I, I think because of his political leanings, he would say, "I love you, but your guy is guilty." And I made up that. Ooh, I made up my mind on that. Yeah. yeah, I made up my mind on that uh, before we got here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Only difference is, I think my dad would tell the truth about that, and so he wouldn't get seated. But you know, I don't think he'd pull the Todd Easter. You know, uh, you know, I, I really can be fair and impartial, even though that is uh, uh, absolutely uh, impossible. Yeah. Well, Dr. Cross, I'm going to tell you what, your episode Friday was uh, life-changing. And I've gotten, I want to tell you that I've gotten a lot, a tremendous amount of text messages from listeners uh, who uh, uh, had the comment of thank you for undertaking that 
topic. Well, I'm I'm glad it worked for you. You have a it's a great you have a great program, and I'm sure you'll continue to be successful. Well, thank you for listening. We're going to take our break and come back for the home stretch here on Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version. Have you or a loved one been involved in an automobile accident? Local attorney Ben Dean worked for the insurance companies and knows all their schemes and tricks. From West Tennessee to East Tennessee and everywhere in between, attorney Ben Dean will work to get you all the money there is to be got. It costs absolutely nothing to call attorney Ben Dean. 615-384-8019. That is 615-384-8019. Call Ben Dean. As the name Clarksville.com Realty implies, we know Clarksville and moreover, we are passionate experts in the Clarksville, Tennessee real estate market. Whether you are planning to buy a new home in Sango or sell one in the fields of North Mead, your experience should be a positive one. Our philosophy is simple. Listen first, offer guidance and suggestions, then act with confidence. Expect the following. Expert analysis of your wants and needs. Again, we must listen to you. Superior knowledge of the inventory of homes for sale in Clarksville. Masterful systems and methods that have proven themselves themselves throughout our years of experience. A closing table full of smiles. Get started today by visiting Clarksville.com. Just one word, Clarksville.com. We know Clarksville so well, we bought it. Clarksville.com. Everybody is driving to Stuart Williams Furniture Company, located on 801 Memorial Boulevard in Springfield, Tennessee. They are open Monday to Saturday, 8 to 5, and boast a superlative selection in all the popular name brands at modest prices, which defy belief. Browse the selection at StuartWilliamsFurniture.net, that's S-T-E-W-A-R-T, no space, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, F-U-R-N-I-T-U-R-E, dot net, call 615-384-7584. Stuart Williams Furniture Company in Springfield, Tennessee, where they either have or can get you everything to make your house a home. A lot of real estate is bought and sold in Clarksville, and all of it has to be inspected and it has to be done right. It's your largest investment of your life. Do you want to leave its inspection to someone who isn't the best? Of course not. 931-980-5759 gets you the best inspection services. Call Bud Wink at 931-980-5759 to get the home you are buying or selling inspected by the best inspection services. That's 931-980-5759. The best inspection services. Changing the quality of home inspections one house at a time. WJZM Radio, Clarksville, Tennessee. Okay, we're back here on Clarksville.com Realty's The Long Version. Got a new show debuting today, and in here with me is the uh, lovely lady who will be bringing you that show. It's going to be called Spirit. Yes, that's right. And uh, you have a wonderful radio voice and a face for television. I oh think I think goodness. you might be a little too pretty for radio. I don't know if you've seen. <laughs> well, the she group. does some TV. I don't know if you've seen the group picture of the J team, but there's more zeros in our team than Publishers Clearinghouse oh Sweepstakes my God. I'm, in the looks department. It's Only a, in the looks it's department. It's a million without a one. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much. I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that they brought this show on because I was failing so miserably in my theological moments uh, on my show, which I almost always had a theological moment for some reason or another. So they went out and got somebody that would be much better than I. Are you excited? I am very excited. It's our very first show today, and thank you for just allowing me to be here to talk about the show that's coming up right after your show. Well, I'm excited about it. We're going to be going, for, for my listeners, we're going to be uh, taking off air a little sooner. Well, you know, you get to the end of the show and you have nothing behind you. A lot of times you floated it a little bit. But that's we're, right. We're going to have a hard break now at the 58 and get ready for spirit. You're going to be produced by the best in the business, in my mind, and oh, John absolutely. Michaels. Oh, absolutely. He's amazing. I, and I love the shirt that he's wearing today. It's just uh, awesome and bright. Well, he. Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, John Michaels will ensure that your show has a fluid uh, 
technical aspect. Every show, every show, I mean, has two components basically: content, which is something over which you, you you're going to exert a lot of influence, and it has a technical aspect, and that's kind of John Michael's role: get you in and out of breaks smoothly, have you come. And you, I'm on a little John Michael pointer here. When he's grinning, he he thinks he's got some pretty clever bump, bumper music <laughs> you, oh, gonna, wow. you know it, he, he kind of gives you that look <laughs> like oh please, please notice the tune and he does a good job with that it's very topical the bump, the bumper music he has is, is very 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 I topical. agree I absolutely agree I've seen him in his element and he is sharp I tell well you. you are the newest member of the J team and you have taken that over from me which I am glad because when I married into the uh, Beckman clan I was the la I was the last uh uh, son-in-law to marry into the Beckman family, I, and and I've been the new guy for 15 years. For 15 years? Yes, ma'am, and I'm ready for some of my nieces. I don't want my daughters to remedy this, but I'm ready for some of my nieces to marry so I don't have to be the new guy. I've been the new guy at every Thanksgiving for 15 years. For 15 years? I did not make it as the new guy on the J-team that long. I made it about uh, five weeks before <laughs> <laughs> before they booked up the... the uh, are you going to be a one-hour show? A one-hour show, that's right. Tell us a little bit about what the content, what your expected content will be. Wonderful. We will have, thank you for asking, we'll have great conversation, great talk, gospel music. We'll invite local pastors, community leaders to come on and just share the love of Jesus Christ on this uh, broadcast. And it's an attempt just to draw people a little closer to God. Have fun now. We're going to have a lot of fun. Have some call-ins and, hey, make it worth tuning in. You know, get a little bit of the spirit going on. Now, you look like that there is a beautiful queen uh, out in the hallway there yes. that, is, that is wearing a crown she's wearing it she is she is wearing it and she has a sash on yes. tell is that it would that be uh, your sister that is my daughter my daughter is nine her name is Robin Gordon and as a matter of fact Robin Gordon She's Miss Tennessee preteen, and I need everyone, if you can, vote for her. Right now, we're in a neck-and-neck -neck, uh, battle, a competition between Tennessee and Louisiana for a uh, scholarship program. And so if you go to Robin Gordon on Facebook, R-O-B-Y-N-G-O-R-D-O-N 2015, find that link and vote for her. We are only like eight votes ahead of Louisiana. They are trailing us. I can't stand uh, oh. losing to Louisiana. We have got to... Everybody they won't stop. There. They don't sleep. Everybody they, get on there and Two in vote. the morning, they're voting. Three in the morning, I, they should be sleeping. The level of state corruption that that state has known in its history. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, we need y'all to please vote. Vote for uh, Robin Gordon. I'm excited to be a part of the WJZM family and hopefully show uh, my daughter some great love by voting for her. Robin, R-O-B-Y-N, Gordon, 2015 on Facebook. I'd love to see about 50 votes come in for right now. Well, I'm going to tell you this as someone that is, has an eye for, for beauty. And you ever met my wife, you'd see it comes readily across. That okay. I obviously am a good you judge. You have that eye. Good judge of beauty, yes. Hi. Your daughter is plenty beautiful. There is no way she should ever lose in any Miss Teen, Preteen, or Miss yeah. USA. She ought to win every contest. That, well, that it's a people's choice. They've got to vote for her, though. Really, the beauty is out the door. They just It's a people's a popularity vote right now that we need. What brought you uh, to radio? What, what made you decide to do a radio show? Well, I've been doing radio off and on for several years. A great friend of mine came into town with a gospel show back when, a long time ago, and he needed a little help, so he asked me to come on a couple of times, and I did it. I enjoyed it. And then I remember years ago, I used to, a church we fellowship with, uh, the pastor had announcements and would ask me to take announcements down to the radio station. And their turning in announcements turned into, hey, you have a nice voice. Well, you do. You, yeah. you, you, your voice is, is very fitting for radio, and it broadcasts very well, and you're very well spoken. Oh, my goodness. That's now, awesome. Now, there is a long history of uh, cooperation between particularly the station and uh, different uh, pastors and, and religious-themed shows. You know, Dr. Jerkins uh, yes. had a show on JZM for many, many years that was brought by Kelly's Byright, was one of the main sponsors there, and one, one of our sponsors, uh, who, who owns a bonding company's father, okay. was uh, partnered. Uh, my pro he may have owned the entire thing, but the Kelly... Uh, in Kelly's Byright wow. was, was not a grant, but Russell Grant was the owner of Kelly's Byright. But um, 
so there's a long history here, and I've had Dr. Jerkins on the show a couple of times. Yes, he's, he, he will be one of my uh, top of the hour uh, guests today. Oh, that is uh, uh, tremendous. He, and he's receiving a national award today. Uh, a national is it award today? For, not today. I'm so Wednesday. sorry. The Benjamin, oh, yes, Wednesday, I had to, the, I had to correct that. July the 15th. He, he is yes. the Benjamin. Thanks, John. The Benjamin. Oh, he's got it. He's all over it. Did he, you hear that? Oh, he knows That brother Dr. corrected Jerkins. me. He, he got it. I'm so sorry. Father, forgive me. In the, uh, the <laughs> He is the Benjamin. <laughs> L. Hooks recipient That's right. from the NAACP. Oh, y'all are on top of that. <laughs> How do you like that? Oh, my gosh. Look, we know a couple of things. Yeah, we know some things, you know. Let me tell you something, sister. I didn't just That's arrive right. here in a vacuum, you know. Hey, I feel like I'm outnumbered <laughs> two to one. My goodness. Go, Dr. Jerkins. Well, speak for yourself. <laughs> what, I mean. what, is, what is your thoughts about, I mean, obviously you have a Christian-based show. Uh, what are your thoughts about the present uh, Confederate flag discussion. We're, we're going to call it a national discussion. I think it's a lot of it's been rather ugly, really. Yeah, it really has. What are, what are your What are your thoughts? Are, are you a Southerner? No, I'm a Northerner. You're Northerner. Yeah, I'm from Michigan, but I moved down here by way of the military. Mm -hmm. um, my thing is, for me, I just I love all people. I'm a, I love all people, God's people. But how I feel about the flag is that I think it has uh, it has a lot of mixed feelings. I, I have friends of all diversity. I'm going to say, and. Um, I just think if it causes that much hardship, let's just get along. I think moving it, you know, to a museum or wherever, I think that's more appropriate because we don't want to just hurt people or offend people. Let's try to get along. Now, I have neighbors in my neighborhood. I don't go up to them. They have flags up. I say, don't take your flag down. I mean, they're my neighbors. Right. But, you know, freedom of speech. Well, you're right. And I think there's a difference between a, a private citizen's right to engage in yeah. what amounts to political speech i think it's absolutely speech. i think their right to uh em emblazon and display a symbol is different than it flying at the state capitol mm -hmm. I, I th I think absolutely it's a different, i think it's a different i question. say take it down you know take it down that's why i move it well and uh, we talked to a uh, historian of of considerable reputation and note and a teacher at austin p friday about we did two hours mm -hmm. on the issue both of us agreed that uh robert e lee would have been in favor of taking it down yeah he 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 refused to be pictured in his confederate uniform after the war mm -hmm. he was not buried in it and his opinion about the m much more recent disagreements than now was that we need to go about the business of making our young people americans and if if, if 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 you know it was more his heritage than anybody's if mm -hmm. if he would take it down i don't know what anybody else is fighting over that's right can we all just get along show some love you know yeah, let's show some love show that's some right love. That, now that was from uh, can't we all just get along with rodney, the famous rodney king that's quote, right you know? i stole it <laughs> <laughs> that's okay but that but you're intelligent enough to know from where it derived mm -hmm. which is impressive because and i a lot agree of people can't we that. all just get along we, we really we really should we, we have should. to i think in this country and i'm glad that it's part of the national discussion because i think it needs to be but we need to quit we seeing, need to quit qu quit seeing color yeah and see people see people when i talk to people like i see you guys like, just people i just see people can i be your white friend i have plenty of white friends <laughs> i have black friends white friends i love people i love people are you a people person i am Everybody's not a people person. I I'm, like to, I'm an extrovert. Or I wouldn't have done what I did for a living for so long. That's right. I met a truck driver yesterday, and he says, I'm not a people person. He said, because he spends so many hours on the road, he said, I just like to spend time alone by myself. You know, he's an introvert. And uh, I just like, I don't know what, I just love and enjoy meeting people. I think people are interesting. So how did you come up with the name Spirit? Was that your, uh, of your own creation? Or? No, I, you guys had a show on this station called The Spirit of Clarksville. Mm -hmm. And um, I just happened to notice and some other people in the community that there was not a gospel program in this area. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, let's have some good godly music that plays, you know, from 11 to 12 and start our lunch hour off the right way if we can. Right. And, uh, you know, some we all need prayer. There are people going through situations. We're going to bring pastors on to give a word of encouragement. Just like your show, it's, it's full of excitement and you talk about great things. It keeps people on the go and I think that's a great thing. You give people something to look forward to. So was the name Spirit somewhat um, derived from that, that show. It's a homage to 
Tell him, John. Program. Tell him, John. Paying no. homage. Is yeah. that what we're doing? It's deep. Yes. Paying homage. You can tell. You see the grin. That's what I, I'm talking about. Oh, that's, that's, that's that. That's that. Bun- you know when he's doing that, the, the bumper music. I don't think I've ever seen that. When when I come in the door, I don't know if I've seen that grin. It's like. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you're you're and you're having the esteem, uh, the 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 esteemed privilege of of working with a real radio uh, professional. Yes, um, I, I plan. Are on you doing the show? I'm no, not, I'm not. not well, I might. You know, if she asks me on sometime, I'll be happy to come. I would love for you to be a part <laughs> and hang out. Hey, I'm not the professional. I just oh yes, by. you are. He's humble. He's a humble man. He is. So today you're on. You're a one hour show. I have one hour show. Yes. And and tell everybody again where to go to vote for the uh, preteen uh, pageant. Yes, let's see those numbers move up. I'll be checking my phone. Her name, my daughter is Robin Gordon. R O B Y N on your Facebook. R O B Y N Gordon. G O R D O N. 2015. Click on that page, like her page. You will see a link, a woo box link, or a big uh, a text box that says vote. Click on that, hit continue, and then vote Tennessee. You got to vote Tennessee. We're neck and neck right now with Louisiana, so vote Robin Gordon, Miss Preteen Tennessee. All That's right. right. I voted there twice. Go. Uh, once. Go. I'm going to do it soon. Oh my uh, goodness. Three times. As soon as I get off air. And I'm share with right all there. your family. Can you share with your family and friends? I'd be happy your to. Neighbors, yeah, you your know, cousins. I've got quite a few Facebook friends. I don't know. You realize the uh, the media mogul with whom you're speaking. I've got like Ooh. 575 Facebook Ooh, friends. You my, know, I, can I have one? Can I'll, I just, I'll have, you know, now you're asking <laughs> me to share. I've been asking everybody to give me followers on Twitter. I'll I can do that. I'll send you some. Why don't we do that? We can we can swap. What I'll do is I will share. That Facebook page with with all my 575 friends. She's got so, about 3,000 on her. Oh wow! So, <laughs> well, you know, and okay. I feel I all feel right. the spirit of Rodney King here today. Can't we all get along? We're getting along just great today. We're swapping and sharing. Well, right? I, I will say that she should have six times as many friends as I. So I'm, I'm not the least I'm bit surprised. I'm not the least bit surprised. Many. No, I can't keep that. up with you. I think you've got more of the friends than I have. Well, you know, I have very low standards. Oh, yeah. And you know, when you have very low state, you know, I will take about any friend I can get. You know, oh my god, somebody that is absolutely desperate for Twitter followers. So, do you have any advice for me in radio? Since I'm beginning uh, with WJZM today marks a new day. Any advice for me? Yeah, I, I, I would tell you this. Okay. When you come out in and out of your ad segments, don't assume that your listeners have heard the whole show. So kind of give them a little recap of what you've done. Like the back like, story. It, like, like in our first hour, we had Kathy Russin on from court, courtchatter.com. There may be some people just joining us that don't know that and don't know that they might need to get the podcast on wjzm.com and go to podcast and enter the long version in, in, into the search engine. They may not know that. Okay. So uh, kind of bring them up to date with what you've done when coming in and out of break because okay. some people are just joining you. And they they don't. And for instance, if you if you want calls, give out the number. I do you know. want calls. So I mean, what's the number? Six four five six four one four. If that's correct. Call spirit, Look, you know. he was ready. He was ready with it. Yeah, you can. And always defer to John Michaels if you need oh, to. Oh, really? Yes, you can always oh, defer to John Michaels. What? Hold on. He's smiling again. What does that mean when he smiles? Uh, he's doing. He's about to do something clever. No, nothing clever. There's our music. That is the long version brought to you by Clarksville.com Realty. Tune in what, who for do we Spirit. Have tomorrow? Who do we have tomorrow? Yeah. It's Talk to Me oh, Tuesday. Talk to Me Tuesday. And you can call us. And you can talk call to us, us because we'll have a lot of fun stuff about which to talk. For John Michaels, Clarksville.com Realty, and Heartland Radio, this is Fletcher Long. I am out. Hey, it's a fact. Bad things happen to good people. DUI, assault, driving on revoke, domestic disputes, or any other charges. Clark's Full Binding has been in business for over 30 years and will be there for you. Call Hannah Christie or Mark Grant, 801-3535. When you need us, that's Clark's Full Binding, Hannah Christie or Mark Grant, 801-3535. Two words come to mind readily when discussing the law firm of Meek.